So I want to start by um, thanking the organizers very much for the opportunity to present. I was dismayed by the events of last year and particularly that I wasn't able to um, make it over to Maastricht and again this year, but I'm really thrilled that the conference is being held because I think there's a lot of fantastic knowledge that comes out of this um, Thrawman Generation Summer School. And so it's a privilege to be able to uh, participate. Uh, work in my lab, as I think many people know, has long focused on blood components, um, the cells and the protein components of blood and how they culminate into the production of a stable clot uh, in hemostasis or a pathologic clot in thrombosis. And we've delineated a lot of mechanisms related to that. But an area that we've touched on in only a few stories and are um, only now beginning to approach in a more systematic fashion is the breakdown of this clot and how um, the mechanisms uh, promote the fibrinolytic process and the release of fibrin and clot degradation products. To put a slightly more molecular um, tone to this, this is a simplified coagulation cascade to simply illustrate um, the initiation of these components and the production or conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. And then, of course, I'm going to illustrate my favorite um, outcome of that reaction, and that is the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. My lab has spent a lot of time um, in recent years looking at cross-linking of fibrin and stabilization of that clot. But even after that clot is formed, um, subsequent processes mediated in part by fibrin acting as a cofactor um, culminate in the TPA-mediated conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. And of course, plasmin is the enzyme that breaks down fibrin into fibrin degradation products. Uh, the most famous of these is known as D-dimer. So in order to assign a, a more specific language to these uh, mechanisms, um, a major workhorse assay that has been um, developed, um, particularly the, through really fantastic efforts in Maastricht, is the thrombin generation assay or calibrated automated thrombography. And I really like this assay um, because it enables us to take um, a simple description like thrombin is made or thrombin is not made and apply a more elegant and defined language to describe changes in thrombin generation and how they pertain to different settings. And so we can use parameters that have been defined like lag time, time to peak, velocity, peak and ETP to really pinpoint how thrombin generation changes in a variety of situations and clinical settings. And that is informative in trying to understand the pathophysiologic mechanisms. Uh, to date, there has not been a similarly um, systematic way to describe changes in the kinetics of plasmin generation. And although a few groups have developed assays um, to look at plasmin generation kinetics, this still has been an area that's remained largely unexplored. Um, and that is something that captured our attention within the last few years. So at this point, I um, introduce Adam Mishta, who I believe may have talked before me through the magic of Zoom and future recordings. Um, Adam, uh, came to my lab to do a sort of postdoc experience several years ago, and I thank very much Adam uh, as well as Bas Delat and Adam's family for allowing all of that to take place. And it's Adam that really drove uh, forward the assay that I'm going to be presenting today, and so I want to make sure that I um, acknowledge that very clearly. He's tremendous um, in developing this uh, assay. Uh, what he's done is to take uh, plasma, and in the data that I'm going to present today, we're showing data um, data from plasma from mice because the mice allowed us to uh, define mechanisms in the reaction and really um, understand how this reaction works. So starting with plasma, we trigger the reaction with tissue factor and lipids to um, form uh, to produce uh, coagulation and also uh, recombinant TPA to induce fibrinolytic activity. And then in parallel, we use a calibrator, an alpha-2 microglobulin plasmin substrate, uh, to calibrate the reactions. Then we use an EKK plasmin-specific substrate in recalcified plasma. And then through uh, watching fluorescence accrual and then a mathematical ma manipulation, just like uh, we do in thrombin generation reactions, um, we um, can produce a curve that looks very similar and to which we can apply the same kinds of parameters that we are comfortable applying from thrombin generation reactions. And these include, again, lag time, time to peak, velocity, peak, and EPP. And just to assure you, these are very similar. Um, the curves are effectively indistinguishable from thrombin generation curves, which makes this a sort of ready-to-use assay. 
So as we began um, taking this assay for a test drive, uh, we first compared plasmin generation in plasmas from mice uh, with and without plasminogen. And as expected, mice that are deficient in plasminogen don't produce a signal in this reaction, um, demonstrating really nice uh, specificity for the plasmin substrate. It's actually a little bit better even than the thrombin substrate. So that's a real feature of this assay. Uh, we can also add in alpha-2 antiplasmin and suppress the detection of plasmin in this reaction, again, demonstrating uh, sensitivity to organic uh, endogenous uh, anticoagulants as well as um, specificity of the reaction. We know that there is a low level of endogenous TPA and UPA in plasma that um, participates in um, sort of maintenance fibrinolysis. The assay itself is not sensitive to those endogenous levels, um, so that is why we add recombinant tissue plasminogen activator to these reactions. But when we do that, we get a really nice dose response to the amount of TPA that we add. Um, so that enables us to tune this assay to a variety of clinical settings and I think offers a lot of flexibility and potential in the way we apply this assay. So I mentioned earlier that fibrin is a cofactor for TPA-mediated plasmin generation. So to test that piece of the biochemistry and understand if the assay is sensitive to that, um, we took plasmas from fibrinogen sufficient, partially deficient, and fully deficient mice. And we first measured thrombin generation. And as you can see in mice, uh, fibrinogen deficiency does not significantly alter thrombin generation. But as expected, when we remove fibrinogen from the system, we get a loss of fibrin formation. And we see that in a conventional uh, turbidity assay here. And then when we um, subject those plasmas to the plasmin generation assay, um, what we see is that a loss of fibrinogen leads to suppression of plasmin generation, um, demonstrating a relationship between fibrinogen or fibrin and or fibrin to, um, and plasmin generation. And so then to take that one step further and differentiate between fibrinogen loss and the role of fibrin specifically in plasmin generation, we made use of this um, really elegant mouse model in collaboration with Matt Flick's group. These are fibrinogen AEK mice. Um, the fibrinogen here is mutated so that it can't be converted to fibrin by thrombin. And when we take plasma from these mice, um, we see uh, data that phenocopy what we see in fibrinogen deficiency, uh, establishing that it's fibrin as the cofactor in this reaction, which really nicely recapitulates uh, the biochemistry that was worked out many years ago um, with respect to plasmin generation um, in the presence of TPA. Uh, we also tested factor 13 sufficient and deficient mice and uh, actually observed no change in plasmin generation in response to the loss of factor 13. So these data are um, supportive of the idea that factor 13 cross-linking is not a major uh, influencer of uh, the ability of fibrin to support plasmin generation. So in my first series of conclusions, um, we've developed an assay that can measure plasmin generation kinetics in mouse plasma. Uh, we've shown that this assay can be used in diluted plasma, which enables small volumes, and that's very helpful for doing studies with mice. We've shown that it's specific to plasmin and sensitive to alpha-2 antiplasmin and exogenous TPA. And we've shown that this assay depends on fibrin formation, but not on fibrin cross-linking. And so at the point at which we had developed this assay and done this preliminary characterization, we became somewhat of a hammer looking for a nail, and we began seeking situations in which we might be able to use this assay to reveal new biology. Um, and so we asked as many people as we knew with interesting mouse models whether we could apply this tool to their plasmas. And in fact, then, a really interesting situation presented itself to us, and that is obesity. So separate from the current global epidemic, pandemic. Um, obesity has long been known as a very as a primary global epidemic. It affects about 500 million adults, defined as having a body mass index over 30, and that includes about a third of the U.S. and European populations. Obesity is associated with a variety of disease states and sequelae, including uh, sleep apnea, and high blood pressure, and cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and then venous thrombosis you see on there, which of course captured our attention. And in particular, having a body mass index more than 30 increases venous thrombosis risk about two and a half fold. 
Uh, a number of previous studies have shown that obesity enhances procoagulant activity. Um, it increases plasmin, uh, sorry, platelet activation, and it increases the levels of circulating procoagulant factors. And there's considerable evidence that those changes manifest in functional changes. Uh, one of these is that um, individuals with elevated body mass index and obesity have increased circulating levels of D-dimer, that fibrin degradation product. But interestingly, they also have evidence of uh, extravascular fibrin deposition. And so the juxtaposition of these two observations that are somewhat paradoxical was interesting to us, that there is evidence of fibrinolysis, and yet there is evidence of persistent fibrin. And so collectively, these suggest that there may be an imbalance in fibrin formation and dissolution, and that seemed like a really interesting setting to apply our new plasmin generation assay. And so we embarked on a study in collaboration with Jim Leyendijk's group at, uh, at Michigan State University, in which we took um, mice and fed them either a control diet or a high fat diet for 12 weeks. And at the end of that period, we weighed the mice, analyzed liver histology, uh, performed clinical chemistry analysis, and we collected plasmas from those mice. So just to characterize that, you can see that with increasing time on the high fat diet, the mice gained more weight. And then just like as seen in humans, the high fat diet fed mice had increased um, fibrin degradation products and probably including uh, specifically D-dimer. So when we began to analyze the plasmas that we harvested from these mice, um, we first performed a conventional assay. This is a turbidity assay in which we can look at fibrin formation and fibrin analysis as an uh, increase in subsequent decline in turbidity. And what you can see is that there's not very much change in the onset parameters um, in which fibrin is formed, but there's a substantial delay in the clot lysis time in the plasmas from the mice that were fed the high fat diet. And so then we took our thrombin generation and plasma generation assays to try to define the inner workings of this turbidity assay. So when we first looked at thrombin generation, we see in fact that there is not a overwhelming change in the early parameters of thrombin generation, although there is a substantial increase in the peak of thrombin generation. And in contrast, when we look at plasma generation in these parameters, what we saw is a substantial change in the early parameters of plasma generation in the lag time and in the time to peak with a substantial prolongation in both of those parameters, but less of a change in the peak uh, plasma generated or the endogenous plasma potential or sort of total plasma generated. So to try to understand the operant mechanisms, we turned in fact back to a really well established and, and robust literature on humans with obesity. Um, and, and a primary finding in that literature is that there is evidence of elevated plasminogen activator inhibitor in obese humans. And so that became a lead uh, potential mechanism and we began analyzing that in our mouse plasmas. Um, as seen in the humans, we found that the high fat diet fed mice had elevated levels of total PI-1. And when we specifically looked at the conformationally active form of PI-1, we found that that was also significantly elevated in the high fat diet fed mice, just like is seen in humans. It's also been noted that PI-1 in humans correlates with body mass index. And so we looked at that analysis as well in our mouse plasmas and in fact saw um, a very nice positive and significant correlation between total and active PI-1 and body weight uh, in the mouse, in the mice. And so then we did an assay that we thought would sort of seal this mechanism, and that is to take plasmas from healthy mice and dope in PI-1 and look at changes in plasma generation. And we expected to see effects that mirrored what we had seen in the high fat diet fed mice. But much to our surprise, uh, we found that when we doped in um, PI-1, we didn't see a substantial change in plasma generation. Uh, we know that we can add um, conformationally frozen active form of PI-1 to plasma and suppress plasma generation, uh, but the levels it took to do this were significantly higher than anything that we were detecting in the mice. And so this didn't actually seem like the mechanism that we were uh, detecting with our plasma generation assay. So to try to understand the operant mechanisms, we uh, turn to a more agnostic approach. Uh, these are proteomic analyses that we did in collaboration with Kirk Hansen's group at the University of Colorado. 
And what they were able to do was broad uh, proteomic analysis of plasmas from these mice. And then through word clustering and a principal component analysis, they observed that they were readily able to separate these mice into two groups, control diet fed mice and high fat diet fed mice, um, clearly indicating that there are substantive differences in the protein composition of the plasmas from these mice. And when we analyze the pathways that are invoked when we look at those particular protein changes, um, these three were top hits. Um, that includes complement and coagulation cascades, um, cholesterol metabolism, and the PPAR signaling pathway. And of course, these were uh, expected pathways uh, to emerge from this analysis. And of course, we were pleased to see uh, coagulation as a, as a top hit because this uh, related directly to the phenotype that we had originally um, detected. So to begin to understand the proteomics, um, what we first did was a sort of hand curation of proteins that we know participate in procoagulant and fibrinolytic reactions. And we ranked these by overall fold change. So you see these listed on the left, and these include many of uh, our favorite proteins and proteins that you will certainly recognize. But when we overlay this with um, proteins that were significantly differentiated um, in, in the changes, only four made this cutoff, and that included factor IX, von Willebrand factor, and then two proteins in particular that captured our attention, carboxypeptidase B2 and C1 esterase inhibitor. The carboxypeptidase B2 and C1 esterase inhibitor in particular, we went in and, and verified uh, levels using conventional immunoassays or ELISAs, and both of these were significantly elevated in the um, plasmas from the high-fat diet fed mice compared to the control diet fed mice. And here's why we were so interested in these proteins. Um, Taffy is a carboxypeptidase. Um, this is carboxy, car carboxypeptidase B2, and it cleaves C lysine residues that are effectively the handles that enable fibrin to function as a cofactor for plasmin generation. And so by cleaving those C lysine residues, TAFI prevents TPA mediated activation of plasminogen. Uh, C1 esterase inhibitor is best known for inhibiting complement and contact factors, including um, factor 11A, but it can also inactivate TPA and plasmin. And so both of these seemed like potential candidates um, for the change in plasmin generation that we had observed. Um, unfortunately, when we went into our uh, simplified assay and we doped in um, uh, elevated levels of TAFI and uh, C1 esterase inhibitor, we didn't see substantial changes in the pattern of plasmin generation, suggesting that the story wasn't quite as clear cut as uh, simply having uh, altered levels of these proteins. And so we were treated to the literature to understand a little bit more about um, these proteins. And in particular, um, this observation uh, we found very interesting. And that is that although TAFI is activated by thrombin, it is a thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor, its activation is vastly accelerated by the presence of thrombomodulin. And it's truly the thrombomodulin thrombin complex. Um, that is responsible for activating TAFI to activate a TAFI. Thrombomodulin accelerates that reaction about three orders of magnitude. And so we went back into the plasmas and searched for evidence that circulating thrombomodulin might also be present uh, in those plasmas. Uh, we performed a Western blot um, looking for a band that would be consistent with a degradation product of thrombomodulin, soluble thrombomodulin that would have been cleaved off of the cell surface. And in fact, we observed a band um, that was consistent with this premise that was significantly elevated in the uh, plasmas from the high fat diet fed mice. And importantly, although this band did not correlate with any of the thrombin generation parameters, it correlated um, quite significantly with the plasmin generation parameters that we observed were different in the high fat diet fed mice, um, supporting the idea that this was a, a potential candidate. Um, there was one piece of this that we found perplexing for a while, and that is that although thrombin thrombomodulin complex can certainly activate TAFI, it's actually far more famous for converting um, uh, protein C to activated protein C and shutting down coagulation entirely. And those two mechanisms seem to be mutually exclusive in, in understanding the uh, kinetics of enzyme generation that we had seen. 
but some very nice literature that is now several decades old, emerging from Laurent Mosnier's lab, as well as Mike Neshheim and Michael Bofa, um, pinpointed an interesting aspect of this, and that is the concentration of thrombomodulin that participates in these two reactions seems to differ. So whereas high concentrations of thrombomodulin are needed to suppress um, procoagulant activity by activating protein C, lower concentrations of thrombomodulin can support TAFI activation. So we um, performed some uh, assays to try to understand the relationship between thrombomodulin concentration and the readouts that we saw. So first, we took uh, normal plasma and we doped in recombinant mouse thrombomodulin. And what we saw when we did that is that we saw a significant dose-dependent prolongation in the lag time and the time to peak plasmin generation without a su substantive change in the peak of um, plasmin generation. And so that recapitulated the pattern we had seen in the high-fat diet fed mice. Uh, when we apply the same thrombomodulin concentrations to the reaction and measure thrombin generation, we find that these lower concentrations of thrombomodulin are actually not sufficient to alter thrombin generation kinetics. So that's also consistent with what we saw. And collectively, when we look at these in a turbidity assay, we see very little change in the onset time of and the onset uh, parameters of fibrin formation, but a delay in the time to lysis, again, looking very much like our high fat diet fed mouse plasmas. So to try to bring this full circle, uh, we took plasmas from those control diet, con control fed mice and the high fat diet fed mice, and we analyzed plasma generation in the presence of two tools. Um, the first of these is a um, monoclonal antibody against thrombomodulin, against mouse thrombomodulin that inhibits thrombomodulin um, activity. And when we include that antibody, what we see is uh, normalization of the parameters um, in plasma generation so that uh, plasma generation becomes largely indistinguishable in the two groups of mice. And the second uh, tool that we tested is a potato tuber carboxypeptidase inhibitor um, to inhibit TAFI or carboxypeptidase inhibitor. And that also seemed to normalize the effect um, that we measured in plasma generation assay is, uh, in these mice. Um, strongly implicating both thrombomodulin and this carboxypeptidase activity in the changes that we saw in plasma generation. And so finally, we revisited that initial hypothesis, and that is that it is the collection or the collective of procoagulant and fibrinolytic activity that determines fibrin formation and persistence, and that it may be an imbalance in these two parameters um, in these two mechanisms that lead to uh, the observations detected in obese humans and mice. And so here we leveraged the, um, the use of the same parameters defined in plasma generation kinetics as are defined in thrombin generation kinetics, the lag time, time to peak, peak, um, ET, ETP and EPP. And so if I show you first, when we then take a ratio of the thrombin generation lag time to the plasma generation lag time, what you see in the high fat diet fed mice is a significant shortening um, of that time, uh, consistent with the idea that there is a um, procoagulant activity that is not counterbalanced by a fibrinolytic activity. So if we apply that same kind of ratio to um, the time to peak and the velocity in both of these parameters as well, we see a tipping towards procoagulant activity without a compensatory change in the fibrinolytic activity or plasma generation kinetics. We don't see um, differences in the TG to PG ratio in terms of peak uh, thrombin or plasma generation. And we actually think what this may suggest to us is that it's the early parameters that really dictate whether fibrin is or isn't formed. And that once fibrin is deposited, it becomes more difficult to remove it and degrade it. And so it's really the early parameters that tell the story um, related to the imbalance in activities that we think we're detecting. All right, so in addition to the early conclusions about the assay development, um, I've also now presented data showing that a high fat diet alters plasma procoagulant and fibrinolytic activity. Uh, we've shown that the high fat diet increases thrombin generation and it delays plasma generation. So quite different effects in these two um, enzyme uh, profiles. 
We've shown that abnormal plasma generation is not fully explained by altered PI-1. And so we know that PI-1 is changed and all of the downstream biochemical consequences that are probably operant, but our data have enabled us to detect a second mechanism. And that is that increased soluble thrombomodulin and carboxypeptidase activity seem to produce this delay in plasma generation. So ultimately, when we put these together, we conclude that there's an imbalance in procoagulant and fibrinolytic activity that may contribute to the pathophysiology of obesity. We also posit that there are additional applications of this assay. These include um, the use of the bleeding scenarios and the use of antifibrinolytic therapies like tranexamic acid. And Adam um, in, with our group has gone on to publish additional papers related to understanding that pharmacology, um, pharmacodynamic relationship, and that's been very interesting uh, to also take that into a human realm. And then um, we also, given accruing data on imbalance in procoagulant and fibrinolytic activity in COVID-19, have applied the assay to that setting as well and are continuing to do so. And there are additional applications um, beyond those as well. So in conclusion, I want to very much acknowledge uh, many members of my lab, current and past, um, who participated in the, the thinking that led to this and then uh, the actual development of this assay. And in particular, again, want to call out Adam Mishta, who's now back in Maastricht um, for being a, a um, tremendous um, force in, in developing these assays. I want to thank um, the Flick Lab, who collaborate closely with us here in Chapel Hill and investigators at other institutions, including Bastelot, who I very much enjoy collaborating with and look forward to more collaborations as we continue to uh, develop these assays. Um, also Jim Leyendijk and his lab for the collaboration on the obesity um, samples. Uh, Dan Lawrence with his input on the PI-1 and Kirk Hansen for his um, past and ongoing um, uh, collaborations related to proteomic analysis. And so with that, I thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to answering questions at the live event uh, in October. Thanks.